Good times. Amelia, aged seven or eight, is running home from school. Reaching the house, she jumps the fence instead of going around the gate. Grandmother sees her and scolds her. These proper little girls do not jump fences. For a few days, Amelia uses the gate, and then she goes back to jumping the fence. Boys are allowed to jump fences. Why shouldn't girls do it, too? Later in life, Amelia Earhart remembered her fence jumping. It was one of many childhood memories that she wrote about. Each memory was like a photo and an album, an event or a person captured and frozen in time. Two people turn up often in the early pages of the album of memories. Grandfather and grand, well, mother, excuse me, Otis, with whom Amelia and her youngest sister Muriel lived for much of the time when they were children. As a young lawyer, grandfather Alfred Otis settled in Atchison during his early days. He set up his law practice and built a house on Quality Hill above the Missouri River. Then he went back east to marry Amelia Hares, a member of a Philadelphia Quaker family. They traveled by train to St. Louis and by steamer down the Missouri, excuse me, down the Missouri. Atchison was then very much a frontier town. Great piles of buffalo bones lined the newly laid railroad tracks. The streets were unpaved. The Indians in blankets roamed the town, sometimes curiously fingering the cloth of Grandmother Otis's dress or lifting the cover of her basket to see what was inside. As time went by, Grandfather Otis prospered. He became a judge of the United States District Court and later a banker. He also made a great deal of money buying and selling land. The Otises had eight children. The fourth was Amy, the judge's favorite. Like her mother, Amy was tall and slim. With dark hair and eyes, she was pleasant, strong-willed, a skilled horseback rider, and a good dancer. She was someone who loved books, art, and music. In 1889, the year when she had planned to go east to Vassar College, she became dangerously sick with diphtheria. She was a long time recovering and in the end decided against going to college. Instead, she went with her father on some of his business trips. During the summer of 1890, when the two of them were in Colorado, she became the first woman to reach the top of Pikes Peak. Later that year, the Otises gave a ball to present Amy to society. Her brother Mark introduced her to a college friend, Edwin Stanton Earhart. Edwin was dark, handsome, and charming, and he was a law student at the University of Kansas at Lawrence. Years later, Amy told her daughters, I liked him right away, and I soon knew he liked me too. Edwin was the twelfth and youngest child of the Reverend David Earhart, an evangelical Lutheran minister, and his wife Mary. The Earharts had arrived in Atchison in Pens from Pennsylvania in 1860, about the same time as the Otises. Reverend Earhart rode as much as 50 miles each Sunday to visit his small and scattered congregation of pioneers and Indians. Weekdays, he taught Greek and Hebrew at a small Lutheran college and also tried to, to scratch a small, excuse me, scratch a living from the soil fighting droughts, dust storms, crop failures, and plagues of grasshoppers. His greatest hope was that Edwin, too, would become a minister. But Edwin chose law and worked his way through the university by tutoring, tending furnaces, and shining shoes. Edwin was not what Judge Otis had, had in mind as a husband for Amy. He might have been intelligent, talented, and a lover of books and music, but as the judge saw him, he was too easy going, a dreamer of big dreams rather than a doer of deeds. Let's look at this picture. 
This is Amelia Earhart's parents, I'm guessing. This was Amy Otis, and she married Edwin Earhart. And this is a picture on their wedding day. That doesn't look like a wedding dress to me. I guess times were different. Let's get back to reading. He refused to let them marry until Edwin was earning at least $50 a month. It took Edwin five years to reach that goal, but Amy waited. After a small wedding, they moved into a house that the judge had bought for them in Kansas City, Kansas. Their first daughter, daughter excuse me, was born in Atchison in the Otis house on July 24, 1897. She was named Amelia Mary after her two grandmothers. Three years later, their second daughter, Muriel, was born. In the family, Amelia was known as Mealy. Muriel was called Pidge, and after the blue pigeon in her favorite song, Edwin's work was mostly as a claims agent for railroads. If, for example, a train derailed and the freight was damaged, Edwin dealt with the shipper. He was paid a fee for each claim he settled. It was work that took him away from home a lot. Amy often went with him on the longer trips, and so Mealy and Pidge spent the school year with the, their Otis grandparents. Their Earhart grandparents? Well, they had died by then. They returned to their parents for the summer. The two girls did not mind this way of life at all. They had each other for company, and they had a warm and loving family wherever they were. Looking back much later, Amelia remembered them as wonderful years. With cousins, friends, and her sister, she had mud fights and picnics and explored caves in the bluff and searched for arrowheads. Amelia was slim and active and athletic, a tomboy who never played with dolls. And all through her childhood, she liked the sports and games and books meant for boys and did not see why girls should not enjoy them too. She was lucky to have parents who let her be the kind of person she needed to be. If she and Pidge wanted footballs for Christmas, they got footballs. Their father took them fishing. One night, she remembered, he let them stay up late to see an eclipse of the moon. Their mother would call them to see how an earthworm was able to move without legs. While cutting up a chicken, she showed them how the lungs lifted in the body and how the wings were jointed, as our hands and our, our wrists are. From time to time, the parents took the girls out of school to go on one of their father's business trips. They felt that anything unusual was educational. Once, though, Amy Earhart's ideas were too advanced, even for Mealy. That was when Amy made the girls bloomers, or gym suits. Look at the picture. It was dark blue flannel knickers, full and pleated, and gathered in at the knee. Bloomers had been invented by Amelia Jinks Bloomer, a leader in the struggle to win voting rights for women. She had thought of bloomers as a way to free women from long skirts that they wore in her day. Amy Earhart thought her active daughters would enjoy them. As a grown-up, Amelia remembered them clearly. She had felt wonderfully free and athletic wearing bloomers. But she also felt more different from the other girls than she truly liked. In later life, people used to ask Amelia if she had been mechanical as a child. She would smile and say she guessed she had been, thinking of the chicken trap that she had invented at age six. A neighbor in Kansas City kept chickens that were always escaping and invading the Earhart garden. So Mealy made a trap out of an orange crate with a hinge. Before I turn the page, you see, women wore skirts back then, and so for a girl to wear pants was kind of unheard of. So these bloomers, I know they look weird, but it says these are them on stilts. And Pidge is on a swing. And they're wearing bloomers that their mother made. I love these pictures. Um, so 
We're talking about Mealy, and she's made a trap out of an orange crate with a hinged, let's see what it says, lid. And the lid was propped up with a stick, and one end of a long string was attached to the stick. Mealy hid behind a tree, held the other end. When she pulled, the stick flew out, and the lid slammed shut. One day, a chicken followed the trail of breadcrumbs that led into the trap. Mealy pulled the string, and the chicken was trapped in the crate, squawking and flapping its wings. Both terrified and delighted by what she had done, Mealy raced into the house. What, she asked her mother, sh should she do now? Why give it back, her mother said. I'm sure you understand that keeping it would be stealing. What a blow, Amelia later wrote. Then, too, there was the roller coaster she built. Edwin had been paid a large bonus and he spent it to take his family to a big fair in St. Louis, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. Mealy was greatly impressed by the roller coaster. Back in Atchison, she was set about to build one. With old planks, Mealy and her cousins excuse me, built a trap from the woodshed roof to the ground. Boards and roller skates became the car. And the first passenger was Mealy. The car swooped down the track, hit the ground, and flipped over. Mealy dusted herself off and studied the problem. What they needed was a longer track, she decided. The track was made longer, and she swished down again, and this time safely. But once her grandparents saw it, the roller coaster did not last long. It was too dangerous. The sled was another sharp memory. First, there was the delight of opening a mysterious big flat package at Christmas and finding inside the kind of sled that boys had. A girl's sled at that time was like a little chair on wooden runners. The rider sat upright against the back of the sled and coasted down the hill. Edwin Earhart had bought his daughters flat sleds with steel runners, the kind they could use for taking belly whoppers. Amelia never forgot the time when her sled saved her from a serious accident. She was zipping, zipping down a steep hill when a junk man's cart pulled out of a side street into her path. The junk man did not see her or hear her. The horse wore blinders and did not see her as it picked its way along. The hill was so icy that Mealy could neither stop nor turn. So she coasted straight on and steered between the front and rear legs of the horse. If she'd been sitting up, her head would have slammed against that horse's side. A favorite game called, was called bo Bogey and was played in an old carriage in the barn behind Atchison House. Mealy, Pidge, and their cousins took imaginary journeys behind teams of galloping horses. They had hair-raising adventures as they lost their way, bogged down in the swamps, or were attacked by wolves. In the carriage, they traveled far and wide. Years later, flying over Africa, Amelia thought back to the trips they imagined in the carriage when they explored Africa. Taking special pleasure in the place's names, synagogue, Timbuktu, Nami, and Kordom. Let's look at our pictures here. These are called captions, and they explain what the pictures are of. So this is a family picture taken around 1907. And in the back of the Otis's house in Atchison, where Mealy and Pidge spent their early school years. So from left to right, we've got Pidge here, Uncle Carl Otis, Grandmother Otis, and there's Mealy in that white dress. That's Uncle Carl's wife and Amy and Edwin Earhart, her parents. And down here, this must be their home. On warm Saturdays, they used to cook lunch outdoors using a brick fireplace they had built themselves. The main dish they made was fried eggs. Mealy was never really interested in cooking except as a way of carrying out experiments. She felt, for example, that husking corn and shelling peas were a total waste of time, energy, and food. 
Surely it would be better to eat the pods and the husk along with the peas and corn. Finally, she was given permission to carry out her experiment and clearly showed that peas were better shelled and that perhaps people were not meant to eat corn husk. Books were always part of her childhood memories, too. The whole family loved to read, either aloud to others or to themselves. In Atchison, there was a large library in the judge's house. Mealy spent hours reading the novels of Scott and Dickens, as well as found volumes of magazines for young people and children's books. She wondered, both as a child and as a grown-up, why the girls in the books were never allowed to have exciting adventures like the boys. It did not seem fair either to the girls in the story or to the girl readers. Mealy also loved horses. She climbed onto delivery horses in front of the house. She became friends with two girls whose father had a butcher shop and who let her ride the horse that drew his wagon. She and Pidge read and reread Black Beauty. The sufferings of beauty and ginger filled them with anger against cruel adults. Their hearts ached for the tired horses that were whipped up and down the streets by delivery boys. Sometimes, when no one was looking, they undid a check rein, the strap used to keep a horse from lowering its head. They befriended a mare belonging to a neighbor who treated her cruelly. One day, the mare bolted to escape the whip, ran away, and plunged over the bridge to her death. Wow. An event Amelia never forgot. The owner had been slightly injured in the chase, and Amy Earhart asked Amelia to take him a piece of cake. But Mealy, who never ever disobeyed her mother, this time put her hands behind her back and silently shook her head. She could not, would not, take cake a cake to a man who'd been so cruel to his horse. One lovely June day, Mealy and Pidge, wearing their best dresses, were heading for prize day at school. Mealy had worked long and hard memorizing the poem she was going to recite. Along the way, they stopped to see a horse that they were sometimes allowed to ride. Mealy discovered that through an oversight, the horse had not been watered or fed since the night before. There was no question in her mind what she had to do. She set about watering and feeding the horse and putting clean straw in the stall. As she was finishing, she heard the town clock strike two, and the school program was nearly over. Amelia raced to school and arrived just as the poetry contest ended. But she told her favorite teacher later she didn't mind. She was glad to know that the poem and, and had had fun learning it. That was what counted, not the prize. The memories of Atchison and Kansas City were of happy, carefree days. But change was on the way. It began when Edward was offered a job with a salary in the claims department of the Rock Island Railroad. He accepted the job because it would mean a steady, reliable income for his family. It meant comfort and security for the first time in his marriage. And in 1907, Amy and Edwin Earhart moved to Des Moines, Idaho. I'm sorry, Iowa. Mealy and Pitch spent one last year with their grandparents while their mother hunted for a suitable house. And in 1908, they left Atchison to live full-time with their parents.